Ring in 2024 at the New Year's Eve Masquerade Gala at the Oceanfront Atlantic Sands Hotel in beautiful Rehoboth Beach with an open bar, surf and turf dinner, Prosecco wall, raw bar, hors d'oeuvres and desserts. It'll be the ultimate toast along Rehoboth Beach. $459 per couple includes gala, one night stay and New Year's Day brunch or $169 per person for the gala only. Book now and call 302-227-2511 or go to AtlanticHotel.com. That's AtlanticHotel.com. Un oyente de Spotify tarda de media entre 20 segundos y un minuto en encontrar la playlist que busca. Y tú te pasas en tu vida 5.000 horas buscando cosas como unos auriculares para escucharla. Y luego decimos... En IKEA sabemos que la vida es disfrutar y con orden mucho más. Por eso descubre cientos de ideas y soluciones para orden y almacenaje a un precio más bajo en tu tienda IKEA en la app o en IKEA.es. Y si lo necesitas, también hemos bajado el precio de los servicios de transporte. The Revolutionary War started as a colonial rebellion against the British on the fringes of its empire. It ended with an independent America and the idea of liberty spreading across the globe. All this happened because the rebels won the major battles. We're here to dive deep into each of them. Welcome to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast, hosted by James Early and Scott Rank. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our series on key battles in the Revolutionary War. In the last episode, we looked at Lexington and Concord, which were battles in the technical sense, but they were kind of like the strike on Japan after Pearl Harbor, the Doolittle Raid. It's much more of symbolic value than it is of significant troop loss of life and of significant strategic battle. We're going to take a little detour here to look at what American troops were actually up against with British soldiers. And also, what was a Continental soldier look like? And we have images of them. Maybe we've seen the Patriot movie that is very liberal with the historical record. We'll see what's happening or what isn't happening. Have you seen the Patriot, James? What do you think about that film? Oh, I've seen it several times. And, you know, I think it's actually more accurate than it gets credit for. And... Michael Troy believes the same thing. He and I had a discussion about it once. I guess we don't need to go into a lot of detail about that. But um, I, I have seen a lot of the criticisms leveled at it, and some of them seem to me to be kind of petty. Yeah. Uh, kind of, you know, like they purposely changed the name of the bad guy in real life, he's based on a person named Bannister Tarleton, who we'll talk about uh, further on down the road. They changed his name to Taviston. And and one person who was critical of the movie said, well, at least get his name right. And I was thinking, <laughs> well, that was the whole point. Duh, they changed it on purpose. So, right. Uh, I mean, I don't think the British probably burned down any churches with people in the church, but they burned a lot of stuff. They And they were not nice. Sometimes they were pretty cruel. They treated, and that guy in particular, Bannister Tarleton, we'll talk about him later, but he was nicknamed Ban the Butcher or Bloody Ban. And uh, so anyway, yeah, so I, I think it's, uh, it's not intended to be super accurate. I mean, it's loosely based on the life of Francis Marion, but I think it gets a lot right too. Bloody ban, ban the man. Well, one thing that I thought of, uh, and I think we'll mention this in this episode is that cannonballs weren't incendiary. They didn't explode on impact. They would just hurtle at massive velocity. And they show that in the Patriot in a battle scene where there's a cannonball that's fired. You see it bounce on the ground. It's rolling. At one hand, you think, oh, it's a dud. But then it knocks off somebody's limbs. And I imagine that would happen if essentially a bowling ball were coming at you at three or 400 miles per hour. That wouldn't be too much fun if it hit you. No, it would not be fun at all. They did have some explosive ordnance, but uh, I think just plain old cannonballs were the bread and butter. Let's look at this and see what actual soldiers were like. First of all, I think you have a quote from uh, the Duke of Wellington and Napoleon that uh, I was surprised to read because it was sort of assumed, or at least I thought that the British soldiers were the imperial superpower. But what did others think of British soldiers? Well, Wellington himself said... Our army, this is a quote, our army is composed of the scum of the earth, the mere scum of the earth. He also said they enlisted, quote, from having got bastard children, some from minor offenses, many more for drink. <laughs> I don't have the rest of the quote here, but he also said that, but there was no, no one he'd rather lead into battle. In other words, they were 
low lifes, but once you got them into battle, they were really good. Hmm. Um, I don't know why I didn't put that down, but I remember that Napoleon said the British army was quote, an army of lions commanded by jackasses. <laughs> so, so he had a Napoleon thought pretty well of the average soldier, but apparently not very well of the officers. So let's investigate whether this was true or not. Let's let's get beyond the quotes and the movies and the stereotypes and let's see. And I want to give a shout out to a lecture series I listened to by Dr. Alan Gelzo. He is a scholar of the revolution and the Civil War and early American history at Gettysburg College. It's that'd be a great place to be if you're a history professor. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, he did a uh, course for the teaching company, which we've mentioned in previous series, called the, the American Revolution. And I think it was uh, 24 or 36 lectures. I can't remember which, but I recommend it for people who want to dig a little deeper than we're going to be going. But So I'm really heavily depending on him for this particular information. I got most of it from his lecture. So the average British soldier... Uh, to the extent that you can have an average one, let's, let's just say like the typical British soldier would have been in his lower 20s, probably 23 on average, about five foot six in height, so not very tall. The most common so background of a soldier in the British Army was a farmer. And also there were some weavers, there were shoemakers, there were other types of craftsmen, but mainly farmers. And most of them had joined voluntarily. But there were a few that had been forced into the army by press gangs. Although I've I've I was actually just listening to a podcast on this yesterday on this subject by a, another scholar and I can't remember who it is. Can't remember his name, but he said it was all volunteer or almost all volunteer. So so don't think that there were too many that had been forced into the army or drafted. They didn't really have a draft in the sense that we think of today. Why did people join the army? Well, a lot of them just wanted a job. They were out of work. Others wanted to get out of their boring farm lives. Others joined in order to avoid death sentences or prison. So they were given the option, yeah, die, be hung, or go into the army. Well, the, gee, the army sounds pretty good if you put it that way. <laughs> it's like the French Foreign Legion, except it's the main national army. It's great. Yeah, and there were others that were tricked into enlisting. So I've, I've read and heard stories of... Uh, and a recruiter's going around and buying somebody a drink and then another drink and another drink and before, and the guy would wake up, passed out. He would pass out and wake up and realize, Oh, I'm in the army now. <laughs> so, Hey, whatever it takes. But it sounds like, you know, from what I've been able to ascertain, most signed up on their own will. But again, I'm not sure that they would do it. All things being equal. A lot of them just needed a three square meals a day and a good, a, a good regular paycheck. Uh, most of them were Scottish or Irish. I think we touched on this a little last time. People from actual England, England proper, they only made up 30% of the army. So that's very interesting. Hmm. And I think it makes sense because I think the Irish were poorer than the English at this point, and, and the Scots were, especially the Highlanders. Um, most of them could not read and write, at least among the enlisted men. We're talking about the enlisted men now. We'll talk about officers in a little bit. Um so most of them could not read and write. Only about a third were able to read and write. Now, most of them received an enlistment bonus equivalent to $100, $100 U.S. dollars today. You know, so nice little chunk of change. A lot of them, it was probably more money than they'd ever seen before. By the end of the war, it rose to the equivalent of $800 today. So that's, you know, that's pretty good, pretty good little signing bonus there. <laughs> Yeah, not quite, not not if that's not like if you were a football player or something, <laughs> but still, hey, sounds good. They were paid only eight pence a day, and I don't have the modern equivalent of that, but it wouldn't be a whole lot. But it worked out to be even less because they had to pay for their uniform and their equipment. That's kind of a rip off, although I mean that's still true in the army today in the U.S. Army. So they actually received once all their expenses were deducted, they received much less, and some even took extra jobs on the side. This was a source of tension between the residents of Boston and the soldiers that were sent there in 1768, which eventually led to the Boston Massacre in 1770. We talked about that in a previous episode. But part of the reason the colonists or the people of Boston hated the soldiers so much is because soldiers were taking jobs that they felt were the people of Boston should have had instead. So. 
So yeah, they, I mean, it's like, it's pretty bad when you're in the army and then you still have to have a job on the side too, just to make ends meet. Yeah. I wonder once your patrol is over, do you hang up your uniform and then duck into your candle shop and start dipping candles and selling them to Bostonians or <laughs> well, <laughs> I wonder yeah, what or this looks like making rope or th- there's this famous story about a guy that went into a soldier that went up to a rope maker and said, uh, do you have any work for me? And the guy said, you can empty my, <laughs> my chamber pot basically <laughs> that he actually used the word of an, a, a vulgar word which i won't use this is a family friendly podcast but anyway uh so yeah that caused problems okay well uh, one question i have in general now the british empire is a global empire at this time they have their holdings in the new world of course in india they're slowly beginning their push into Africa, which will intensify in the 19th century. Do they have a large standing army? I mean, I know they have to some extent, but do they rapidly throttle up and down if there's a major war going on? Do they typically always have a large troop contingent and they just add to it if they need more troops? Or what does that look like? Well, they they tried to keep the army as small as possible because the army costs money. And keep in mind that the British government was in big debt still from the French and Indian War or the Seven Years' War, as they called it in Europe. So they it's not like they just kept a massive army all the time like like the U.S. does today. Um, but they, they did have a significantly sized standing army, but they did have to beef it up whenever a major war popped up like this one, for example. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, this is, it's an interesting because we've talked about this as a transition point between the Middle Ages when – there's no standing army at all. There are knights that are trained, but then you have to completely field it from almost nothing when a war breaks out versus today when you do have large standing one. Just to put it in perspective, let me say one more thing. I, I, I took another note that I didn't put in our show notes, but about 50,000 total British soldiers served in the American Revolution. Again, I just just heard this on a podcast. It's called Ben Franklin's World. You've probably heard of it. Really good podcast about 18th century America. But um, so about 50,000, give or take 20%. That's a pretty wide range. They didn't really keep super strict records, so it's hard to say the total number. But about 50,000, give or take uh, (laughs) 10,000. So let's say between 40 and 60,000 served in the American Revolution. And of those, about 5,000 deserted. We will see this later, but many British soldiers just tried their luck with running away and starting a new life in America, although the penalties were very severe. Yeah, so what was the organization like for the British Army? Okay, so the basic unit was the regiment. The regiment was in the several hundred, it would be 600 to 1,000 range. It was the highest official unit, although regiments were sometimes grouped together into brigades of bigger units, which would have three or four regiments on an ad hoc basis. Each regiment had its own number to identify it. Many had a history, like a long history going way back, and there were a lot there was a lot of regimental pride. You know, it's kind of like in the US Army, we have the, the 101st Airborne, which has a great history. Uh, the 82nd Airborne, you know, the the first division, the big red one, and so on. Uh, so they had the, a similar thing going on. Each regiment was divided into eight battalion or regular companies. Then they would have a grenadier company and a light infantry company. We talked last time about grenadiers and light infantry. Uh, Grenadiers were kind of your bigger, tougher guys. Originally, they were founded to uh, primarily throw grenades around. But then over time, they just kind of became – they're kind of like heavy infantry. And then the light infantry is the exact opposite. Those would be people moving quickly, not having as much equipment. So, again, within each regiment, you had eight regular companies and – a grenadier company and a light infantry company. So that would be a total of 10 companies. The company would have about 60 to 100 men, and they were commanded by a captain. A regiment was usually commanded by a colonel. Uh, Let's see. And they also have cannon in there too. Um, Artillery worked into each regiment. Artillery were not separate units. And let's see. Yeah, light infantry were used, back to the idea of light infantry, they were used kind of like as skirmishers or scouts. They would go out ahead of the main body and just kind of scout out, see what kind of obstacles might be on the ground, try to get some idea of the enemy disposition. Were they fortified? Were they dug in? Did they? How many were there? Where exactly were there? Things like that. So 
We saw uh, in the Battle of Lexington that light infantry and grenadiers had gotten detached from their regular units and were sent out and kind of all mushed together with other light infantry and grenadiers. So that was an interesting situation. That's part of why they were not as effective as they might have been because they were under new commanders and they hadn't worked together and things like that. So that's the basic organization. Yeah, and speaking of commanders, going back to that Napoleon quote that the British Army was an army of lions commanded by jackasses, does that have something to do with the training of enlisted soldiers and then also the leadership of officers? Is he saying that the training is effective or the men are hardy and brave, but the officers are just these foppish dandies who fall into the office? Or What do you think is going on there? Before I get into officers, uh, let, we'll talk a little about training. Now, the British Army was a professional army. These guys were well-trained, you know, serious professional soldiers. They trained in their regiment. Now, the training was mainly drill, so it was mainly just about how to march in an organized fashion, how to go from columns to lines and lines to columns. In other words, uh, marching, they marched one way uh, in columns, and then they would get into the battle and they'd de deploy into lines. At vertical going to horizontal, basically, if that makes sense, kind of like similar to the, the Civil War situation. Um, and then, of course, they had to learn how to fire their weapons, which is very complicated. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but they didn't have a lot of physical training. So don't think about all the Vietnam movies you've seen, <laughs> you know, or at least like Full Metal Jacket, where the guys are, you know, doing obstacle courses, jumping through tires and crawling commando style under a net and going on a monkey bars and things like that. No, no, no. They didn't, they did almost no physical training. They didn't run. Um, one thing I forgot to mention about regiments is that each regiment we talked about, they had their own history. They also had their own distinctive color for lapels and cuffs. And they usually had the number of the regiment stamped on the buttons and discipline. As I alluded to earlier, discipline was very strict, very strict. I mean, you could be beaten or flogged for what we would consider today to be very trivial offenses. And they were all, you could get up to a thousand lashes for some offenses. Can you imagine that, Scott? Yeah. How does that not kill you? I don't know. I really have no idea. I know one American commander that we'll talk about later, Daniel Morgan, when he was in the British Army during the French and Indian War, he uh, claimed that he'd gotten, I think it was like one lash. They 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 send sentenced him to three hundred lashes for some offense he had committed, and but they only gave him two ninety nine, and he always used to say, "Well, I'm I'm waiting for that one last lash." <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's the man and the discipline. Uh, there were capital offenses. Desertion was a capital offense. So if you ran away and you got caught, you would be hung or shot with a firing squad. Now, officers, you touched on officers. Officers were drawn mainly from the gentlemen. In other words, the, gent the gentry, the aristocracy, uh, clergy sometimes, politicians. Many were Scottish and Irish, just as with the enlisted men. And there was no military academy. So these guys had not been to West Point or the equivalent thereof. The British founded one later, but not yet. And most officers attained their office by buying it. So... You know, if you want to be the lowest rank, which I believe was ensign, then uh, you would have to pay X amount of pounds. And if you wanted to be a lieutenant or lieutenant, as they call it, you had to pay more. And if you wanted to be a captain, you paid still more all the way up to generals. You have to pay these astronomical sums. So it wasn't like, OK, you buy l lieutenant and you work your way up through the ranks. Um, you could go straight into a general position if you had the money. That, it didn't always work that way. Some people did actually rise up through the officer ranks through merit and through uh, success on the battlefield. But a lot of times you just could pay the price for whatever the rank was, and it didn't matter what your training or background was. So, yeah, a lot of the officers were jackasses. They were total, <laughs> total rookies uh, who had no idea what they were doing. They just had the money to buy their position. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. It's interesting. We saw in the Civil War that there were some officers who very much lived up to having no experience whatsoever and crumbled and their line fell apart when they came under any fire. 
But then there were many who really surprised us uh, by learning quickly on the job. And one point there, and you can add to this, James, about the question of what would be the incentive if you're well enough to do to buy an office, which would be a lot of money once you get up to the higher ranks, but you have no experience whatsoever and you're really risking death. Why on earth would anyone do that? There's a lot of social prestige to being an officer. Uh, And to give an example, I read a wonderful book called The Sense of the World about a world explorer who was blind. But he served in the Navy during the period of the Revolutionary War, was uh, an enlisted man, made it up to lieutenant. And for years, if not decades afterwards, he would wear his uniform around town. So that would immediately confer upon him privilege uh, to say that this is a gentleman. People would immediately know it. He would be shown respect in society. So it's your one-way ticket. As long as you serve in the military, you don't die and return in reasonably good shape. You can rest on your laurels for a long time. So that would at least be one incentive. Can you think of any other reason? Well, yeah, it's also a good stepping stone into politics. You know, just like it it often has been in America, same thing in Britain. If you were uh, a famous general and you were successful, you might end up being in House of Commons, maybe the House of Lords, maybe even the cabinet or maybe even prime minister. I know uh, Wellington, the Duke of Wellington, who we talked about earlier, obviously he didn't fight in the American Revolution. He fought on the continent, but he did end up being prime minister. So uh, there's it, it gives you, in addition to social prestige, it gives you political prestige. It can lead to financial benefits. It can even lead to being made a knight or a, a you know a noble, a sir, like William Howe is one general we'll talk about later. William Howe was elevated to the knighthood by King George, so he became Sir William Howe, and and you know with that obviously often comes land grants and even estates and castles or palaces or whatever you call them. So yeah, there's all kinds of, of benefits from being, especially being an officer. Not not so much an enlisted man, but also you got a pension too. So an enlisted man could, if he survives, could get a pension. And as we just said, officers could get much, much more. There's a fair amount. And at this point, if you assume that you're simply going over there to rough up some colonists and then return safely home to England, that could be an understanding. And But uh, we're, I don't want to get too cynical because I'm sure there would be those who would sign up for Rue Britannia and want to make sure that the sun never sets on the British Empire uh, mm-hmm. with, with fervent patriotism in there. So I don't want to be like this cynical guy who only sees the most base motives and whatever. Historical figures too, it always runs the gamut. Well, those are officers. How well were people equipped? You said people had to buy their own uniforms. So what did that look like? Well, the British Army was very well equipped in general. Now, the quality of the equipment at the enlisted level was not always the same as the quality for officers. But um, we'll talk about what they looked like first. Of course, everybody knows that the British had red uniforms at this time, red coats. They were called the red coats. Um, So they would have a full body red wool coat. You know, wool is... (laughs) It's very hot, <laughs> although it breathes well too, and it, and and it you know it, 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 if you sweat a lot, it ends up cooling you to a certain extent. Um, it had a divided rear skirt and turned back cuffs, so the coat went all the way down to your knees and even lower sometimes. Underneath your coat, you would have a sleeveless white vest and white knee breeches. Uh, you would have a black three-cornered hat, and so that's what you looked like. As I mentioned earlier, your cuffs and lapels would be might be a different color depending on the regiment you're in, and your buttons might have your regiment number stamped on it. But the most important piece of equipment to every British soldier, and really Continental soldier too, we'll, we'll save the Continental ones for a little bit later, but the most important thing that a British soldier would have would be his gun, you know, his rifle, which I, I shouldn't say rifle, let's say musket. They were not rifled for the most part. The primary weapon used by the British soldier was called the Brown Bess, a big, long brown gun with a wooden stock, mostly wooden body. The barrel was made out of metal, but uh, and it was smooth bore. It was muzzle loading. It was a single shot. It was a flintlock and it was a 75 caliber musket, uh, although I've seen in some sources where it said 69 caliber, but anyway. I'm not going to get it. I'm not a like a super gun junkie. I'm not going to get a lot of detail on that. 
But let's break all those down. Let's unpack what I just said. So it was a musket. It was a, you had a three and a half foot long barrel with no rifling. What that means is, is that the, the barrel was smooth on the inside. Sometimes it's called a smooth bore. This is different from the civil war In the civil war. Most weapons were rifled. And I think people may have heard, if you haven't heard the civil war series and you don't know what that means, rifling means you have a spiral groove cut into the inside of the barrel. And if you have that rifling, it puts a spin on the bullet and makes it more accurate. And uh, especially for, it can shoot longer distances. Uh, but these did not have that. These just kind of shot the thing straight out with no spin or anything. And that resulted in the maximum range being about 80 yards. If you Sometimes you would have a really good shot who could maybe shoot 100 yards but much less than a rifled musket. Uh, and really, for some, it would be 60 yards. So you had to be relatively close to your target in order to hit it. The muzzle velocity was relatively low. That's going to result in a lot horrible wounds, which we'll, I think we're going to, yeah, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, also, so that's, that's what I mean when I say a musket, just a smoothboard, unrifled barrel. It was muzzle loading. That means you had to load it from the muzzle, the business end, and it wasn't breech loading. You didn't load it in the back by where the trigger is. You load it at the very end. It was 75 caliber or 69. The ball was totally round. I'm not going to say perfectly round because they probably didn't make very many perfectly round ones, but it was supposed to be round. It was one half inch in diameter, and when it entered a human body, it crushed bones. It tore up muscle and organs. Pretty much if you got shot uh, in an arm or a leg, it was going to be amputated. If you got shot in the gut or anywhere in your torso, in your head, in your groin, usually that's a fatal wound because right? the med medical technology was non-existent pretty much. It was awful. And then it was a single shot. You can only shoot one bullet out and then you have to reload it. So the way this would work is the the soldier would take the, the musket, put it on the ground, put the, the butt end, and he would pull a cartridge out of his cartridge pouch, which he would have strapped to his belt. He would use his teeth to tear it off. There would be powder uh, in this little cartridge. Cartridge is probably the wrong word, but we'll just call it that. Um and he would, oh, I'm sorry, I just knocked my microphone off almost. I'm so okay. excited about, I'm so excited about guns. I'm like trying I, to, I, <laughs> I'm trying to mimic this motion, but I'm not, <laughs> the British soldier would typically not have a microphone in front of him. <laughs> All right. So once again, you take this cartridge, you tear it open with your teeth. You would put some of the powder in a pan near where the uh, trigger is. And then you'd close that so it wouldn't spill out. And then you'd stand it up and then you'd put the rest of the powder down into the barrel. And then you would take the rest of the cartridge and it would have the ball inside of it. And you would stuff it down there with the paper in it. And then you had to pull out a ramrod and push it down. Uh, you know, I've seen some videos where they do this. Maybe we'll give a link to the video. There's some really short videos where they show how this works. But but anyway, so you're you're standing the thing up, you put the powder in the barrel, then you put the ball in the barrel, and then you ram it down. Then you have to take the ramrod out and replace it because you don't want to lose your ramrod. And then you would pick it up and uh, you would pull the trigger. Now, the, uh, this type of gun is called a flintlock. This is different from a Civil War musket or rifle. Civil War, by then they had uh, percussion caps. But in this situation you would pull the trigger and that would allow a hammer with a screwed down piece of flint to strike a movable frizzen. A frizzen is just like a, the thing that the flint strikes against and it would cause a spark. It would go down through a little hole into the barrel, light the gunpowder and force the, it would set off. There would be a flash. It would set off the powder in the barrel and that would force the ball out. Okay. Does that make sense, Scott? <laughs> yeah. The, good, good, good job with the description. I mean, that's that's hard to articulate with words without just seeing a picture. It, it's more complicated process than a Civil War rifle, which that was complicated too. But um, 
And a good soldier could get off about three shots a minute, maybe four if they were really fast. Okay, well, I'm curious about that because uh, James will be very glad to know that I did watch Glory, the uh, Civil War movie with Matthew Broderick in it. We can still be friends then. Okay. <laughs> yeah, if uh, if all of you have listened to the Civil War series, we mentioned that there was a drinking game where uh, whenever James mentioned a movie or when I mentioned Napoleon or Napoleonic tactics, which, <laughs> hey, this is around the time of Napoleon, so don't worry, you're going to get a drink of your um, uh, mash or your... Uh, rum if you want to but anyway I'm here's always just a little kid when all this is going on right now so <laughs> and there's not very many good movies about the revolution so here's my question um matthew broderick actually quotes in that movie that a good soldier can get off three shots in a minute and if i remember our discussion correctly those numbers were accurate i mean that would be a, a very basic thing to screw up for a film so if that is accurate why is there not an appreciable change of loading time from um, an 80-year period from the Revolutionary to the Civil War? Well, if you think about it, they're they're going through almost the same procedure, okay? So you think about it, they they have to pull their cartridge out. That's true for both of them. The cartridges didn't change much. Now, the bullet was very different. We talked about in our Civil War series, the mini ball was used in the Civil War. It was a kind of a conical almost shaped bullet with – little um, grooves like like rings around the base and those would link up with the rifling inside of the barrel to put that spin on it and make it so deadly. But think about it. In both cases, the soldier has to pull out the cartridge box. They have to tear up the thing off with their teeth. They have to put powder down the barrel. They have to ram the bullet down. Uh, and then when they're about to fire – in the Civil War, they would put a percussion cap on and then fire, whereas in the Revolutionary War, they would put a little bit more power powder in at the base. Well, I shouldn't say the base, like the pan, which is near kind of near the trigger. So, you know, it might be just a tad faster in the Civil War, but you're still having to do pretty much almost the same exact stuff. The one exception being no percussion cap in the Revolutionary War. Right, sometimes, okay. Some, I should say sometimes with a... Uh, a brown bess or any kind of musket in the Revolutionary War era, you would have a flash in the pan, but it wouldn't ignite the powder. And that's where we get the phrase, a flash in the pan, you know, for oh. something, something that really looks good, but it really doesn't amount to anything. Okay. Did not know that. Well, all right. Thanks for the description. And that is a good reminder that if we think of military technological change now from the 1930s to today, where you go from barely out of the Wright brothers to stealth bombers and modern avionics it's tremendously different but back then there isn't as much of a change because technological progress sort of works in a logarithmic fashion of how fast yeah. it goes let me say one other thing too i'm sorry to interrupt but um officers this was also true in the civil war officers didn't usually have muskets they would have flintlock pistols and they would have swords. It was very a very big deal. A, the sword was a, a kind of a status symbol as well as a weapon. If your if your pistol didn't work, the chivalric spirit is not dead. Then, uh, my little contribution here when I was mentioning the Patriot earlier at cannonballs with cannon uh, with artillery fire, the names of the balls would be named by the weight of the ball. So you would fire a three pounder. Okay, James, final quiz, uh, final exam. How much does that weigh? Uh, three pounds? <laughs> yeah, congratulations. Oh, wow. You're thinking, all right, is, is it- a trick question? I mean, does yeah. it want kil kilograms or what? Is it one of those weird imperial units, a hogshead, a whatever, a furlong? Um, no, it is three pounds and- like we said, cannonball didn't explode. The exploding ball is invented in 1787 by Henry Shrapnel. So that gentleman is the um, eponymous inventor of shrapnel. Not that great for what happens afterwards, but there he goes. Mm -hmm. So it would bounce down the field when it hit the ground like a bowling ball. So if you want to see an example of that, you could probably find a YouTube clip of the Patriot where that does happen, and it's pretty grisly. All right. Well, the, that's how it all comes together. Uh, so let's talk about tactics. What's going on here at this time in the 1770s, 1780s? All right. So this is also similar to the Civil War, although, as we've seen, the the muskets used in the Revolutionary War didn't have near the range as Civil War rifles. But um, 
The point of firing at the enemy was to mass the firing to disrupt the enemy. It was called accuracy by volume. Individual accuracy was not stressed in general. Now, that will be a little bit different in the Continental Army. In the Continental Army, you'll have rifle units where they actually did have rifles, although rifles were not considered to be the -the state-of-the-art weapon back then because back at this time, rifles had very, very long barrels, and they took forever to load. Uh, They took much longer than a regular uh, smoothbore musket. I think of it this way. It's kind of like you're not going for pinpoint accuracy like sharpshooting or sniping. You're going for uh, – you're turning a, a line of soldiers into a giant shotgun, okay? You're just trying to put out as much fire and hope you hit some stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just mass – just you know, put out as, as much lead as you can, and you're bound to hit something, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, um, Even more key to warfare than shooting was the use of the bayonet in charges. British soldiers were famous for their love of using the bayonet. The bayonet, I'm sure most people know what it is, but in case any of the listeners don't know, a bayonet is a sharp knife stuck at the end of the rifle barrel. It was was designed so that the very bottom of it would – was round and it could be just uh, stuck or, or slid onto the rifle barrel and it would stay. And that turned your, your I said rifle, that turned your musket into a gigantic, uh, like a pike almost, or like a spear. So the British Army, when they attacked, they would march up, they would fire once or twice, but then the, the main point was to get in there and charge. And part of it was psychological warfare, Scott. They wanted to scare the enemy and it worked quite a lot of the time you know if you see somebody uh, you well not somebody you see several hundred professional redcoats charging at you with bayonets you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna be you can at least at least be tempted to turn around and skedaddle <laughs> the the line of soldiers above all else was to push the enemy back so in some ways you know if you take away the first volley or two I guess the tactics are not that much different from the days of the Greeks and Romans, right? Just shoving them back. Although it wasn't, you didn't have shields and these organized shield walls and things like that. Right. Uh, Dead and wounded were usually left on the field with the exception of officers. There was no organized medical corps. So if you got wounded, you would just fall down and hope eventually that maybe if the battle went your way, somebody might find you and take you to the hospital. But a lot of wounded died either of their wounds directly or of disease caused by their wounds. Okay. Well, a couple of follow-up questions. This is something that if we're still using our civil war podcast, drinking game rules, it's a chance for another drink. Cause I'm going to talk about Napoleon or Napoleonic oh, tactics. Oh, no. <laughs> Although I think we'll have to figure out what the new rules are for this series. Uh, they'll come into their own at some point. Um, <laughs> something we mentioned a lot in the civil war podcast series is that, All of these graduates of West Point worship the altar of Napoleon and study Napoleonic tactics where you have a fast field movement combined arms assault with these musket men combined with cavalry combined with artillery and bayonet charges. And Napoleon would put all these together. And um, this is essentially the military technology, very similar to the time of Napoleon. It doesn't really Uh change much. Now, this doesn't work in the Civil War period. And the battlefield deaths are absolutely horrific because then you do have more rifles. Then you can pick people off from far away. Then things like Pickett's Charge are an absolute slaughterhouse. They wouldn't have been in the late 18th century when the accuracy is much shorter. So do you see some sort of, maybe not as slick as what Napoleon would do, but this kind of combined arms Napoleonic tactics happening at this time by the British? Uh, Not really. Uh, The British attacks were almost entirely infantry. Artillery was used to some degree, but, uh, and, and there's a little cavalry we'll see, but you don't really see the, Infantry, artillery, and uh, cavalry working together in concert like you're going to see later, especially okay. not cavalry. Cavalry was mainly for scouting purposes, although we did have – there are a couple of battles where cavalry were significant. But uh, artillery were usually fired at the beginning just to kind of soften up the defenses. But it, it's not like it was in Napoleon's time. Like you said, Napoleon really, uh, I guess, perfected – the use of the different kinds of military 
techno military units and technology that were available at the time. Right. So, which makes sense. He's being followed, even though the technology makes it uh, hopelessly out of date. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. Another thing too, when we, again, going back to the civil war, we did spend a few, a good amount of time looking at how horrific it would have been to see a battle after the battlefield where you have men groaning in pain who've been shot. Maybe their friend can come back for them and drag them back to a medical tent. If they get there, then there's a surgeon who has for all intents and purposes, an elegant hacksaw who is working fervently on amputations you could probably knock people out with either if you're lucky, but maybe they wouldn't get that if supplies were short. So you don't have combat medics like in World War II that are running up to people, giving them a shot of morphine, and then bandaging them up and dragging them off. Um, so would a civil war or a revolutionary battlefield be somewhat similar to a revo- revo- civil war battlefield? Yeah, there would be a lot of bodies uh, that would lay out there for a long time. Definitely. I've there's a lot of I've read a lot of reports that were or letters that were written by soldiers afterward, and they would just talk about bodies everywhere, blood everywhere. So it would have been yes, it would have been horrific. OK, so that's what it looks like on the British side. So let's get to the Continental Army. What does it look like on the American side? All right. Well, the the Continental Army or the American Army evolved greatly over the eight year period that we call the Revolutionary War. Um, and. There were a lot of similarities with the British Army, so like we won't have to spend all that time that we just <laughs> <laughs> just now. We'll focus on the differences. If I mean, uh, be, because a lot of the American officers, the older ones anyway, they had served in the British Army or at least in the militia. When you think about George Washington, Horatio Gates, Charles Lee, Daniel Morgan, uh, uh, Francis Marion, a lot of people. Not the younger guys, obviously, like Alexander Hamilton and Nathaniel Green and people like that, Knox. But but the, the ones that were, say, 40 and up, a lot of them had been in the British Army. So that, that was their model. That's how they, they organized their units and their tactics and everything after the British model. But at, at the very beginning of the war, obviously, there was no Continental Army. There was nothing. So you had militia companies. And every town pretty much had its own militia company. But these were barely effective as military units, especially at the beginning. They were as much social clubs as they were fighting units. They would meet together once in a while. They might drill a little bit, but mostly they would sit around, eat and drink and be merry and just have fun. It was a big party. They elected their own officers. And they didn't adhere to traditional military discipline. You know, if, you're, if, if your uncle is in the Elks Lodge and they go off to war, that's kind of what it would look like. Pretty much, yeah. If you just said, all right, this Elks Lodge or Moose Lodge, congratulations, you're a company <laughs> now. You know, Go ahead and vote for your captain. And if you don't like what your captain says, eh, no big deal, just don't do it. Um, Washington was absolutely... <laughs> horrified he never ceased to he never stopped complaining (laughs) about how bad militia was um over time the continental soldiers the the continental army was officially created in 1775 and uh george washington of course was appointed as the commander-in-chief they were grouped into regiments they were made more regular along the british model but um by the summer of 1775, the militias organized into armies specific to each colony. So you would have like the uh, the regiments of Massachusetts, the first, and or the New New Hampshire regiments, and they would send their own generals. And again, a lot of these generals didn't have any experience, or at least not very much. Some of them had no military experience. They were just leading members of their community and their colony. Officers from one colony didn't like obeying orders from officers of another colony. So like if you're from Rhode Island and I'm from New Hampshire, I'm not going to do what you say. That was a a struggle that they had to overcome. Units often came and went as they pleased. And the more I read about the revolution, I I never cease to be amazed by this. People would just – they'd sign up for, say, three months or a year, and then they'd go home. Um very few signed up for the duration of the war, and, and Washington was constantly plagued by 
just the army just melting away, disappearing, not because they're running away or deserting, but just because their, their term is up. Um, so very, you know, you, you'll, we'll see like, for example, at the, uh, beginning of the New York campaign, the campaign in which the British came down and attacked New York city, Washington had roughly 20,000 soldiers, but by the time the British had chased him through New York and into New Jersey, he was down to 3,000. <laughs> These other, I mean, not, not all those were killed or wounded, although a lot were. A lot of them, thousands of people just went home. So I don't know. Very difficult to be a leader if you don't know how many people you're going to have the next day. Uh, I'll talk about the uniforms. At first, there were no <laughs> uniforms. Uh, and this was true for a long time. A lot of units, just they just wore regular clothing because – Nobody had uniforms to provide. The militia companies didn't have uniforms, usually. They were, when, when they had uniforms, they were similar to British ones, except they were blue and buff. Uh, as we've seen in some movies, George Washington actually designed the Continental Army uniform. And after 1779, you saw more of the blue and buff. Sometimes they were blue and red. Militia, as I said, tended to not have uniforms. After the French joined the war, they began sending brown uniforms with red trim. So it's not like the British Army where everybody looks the same. Everybody's got a red coat. Everybody's got a black hat. Everybody's got white breeches. Uh, you just <laughs> you didn't know what you were going to get. And supplies ran short among the Continentals, and sometimes they had very little clothes or no clothes. Some, some people, their uniform was a blanket that they threw around <laughs> their naked body. Things get bad for a while. Muskets and other equipment were similar, except that the Americans are going to gradually use French muskets more and more and French gunpowder, which were superior to their British equivalents. And why French, you ask? Well, you'll just have to wait and find out, listener. That's right. No spoilers <laughs> in this early episode. That's right. Why, how come French? We will tell you very, very soon. All right. That's my horrible <laughs> French accent. My students always crack up when I try that one. All right, Continental soldiers, most of them were of British descent, uh, but some were descended from other European nations. Uh, kind of like in the British Army, there were Scots, there were Irish, there were Scots-Irish, but there were others as well. There were some Germans. Now, the British, I didn't mention this, the British also employed a lot of German mercenaries, which were generally called Hessians, and we will talk quite about a, quite a bit about them later. So let's put them on the shelf for now. Uh, back to the Americans. You had Native Americans or Indians that fought on both sides, and African Americans fought on both sides. When African Americans fought in the American Army, uh, they fought in integrated units. They fought side by side with whites, and that is not going to happen after this war until the Korean War in 1950s. So that's an interesting little um, fun fact there. Most Continentals were farmers, not surprising, because most citizens were farmers. Uh, the average age was 21 for the American-born, but 29 for foreign-born. 14% of, uh, of these foreign-born soldiers in the American Army were transported convicts who were sent to the colonies as indentured servants. So not always really nice guys. <laughs> but you know? not too sad about taking a shot at the British. Yeah, exactly. A lot of them really had a, a you know, a, a bone to pick with the British. So, understandably so. So, uh, many people who joined the Continental Army, as with the British, they did so for financial reasons. The bounties were a big draw. They kept having to grant larger and larger bounties or signing bonuses, if you will. Although the pay is going to be so irregular, we will see that. American soldiers are often go months without being paid. And when they do get paid, they get paid in continental dollars, which <laughs> they're uh, like, con they're like they, Confederate dollars, huh? Yeah, pretty much. You know, they're kind of worth a little at the beginning, but by the end, they're so worthless that a saying sprout up, uh, sprang up called worthless as a continental, <laughs> you know, uh, the, the U S army and the U S government in general was extremely cash strapped during this entire war. They do get a little bit of financial aid from the French and then later from other nations, but uh, constant shortages of money as well as supplies. Now, with the officers, this was a little bit different. They, didn't, they weren't sold. So the Americans didn't just say, all right, who wants to be a general? Oh, okay, you know, give me 100 pounds or 200 pounds. They, 
They were usually given on the basis of merit, although at the beginning of the war, as I touched upon earlier, a general might be somebody who is just a leading citizen, like a, a wealthy merchant. Uh, Washington was chosen because he had previous military experience. He had fought in the French and Indian War. Other soldiers like, uh, I, I, I should say, other officers, people like Charles Lee had been in the British Army. Horatio Gates had been in the British Army. Daniel Morgan, people like that. But a lot of people that ended up being American generals had – no experience. All right. They weren't all generals necessarily, but uh, people like Henry Knox, he taught himself out of a book how to be a soldier, and he became very effective. Uh, Nathaniel Green is the same way. Alexander Hamilton uh, reached the rank of colonel. People like the Marquis de Lafayette, a very colorful character that we'll talk about later. He was granted a commission as a major general. He didn't have hardly – he was 19 years old when he came over. He didn't have time to have military experience hardly. But but some of these – we saw in the Civil War that there were people that had no experience, but they were quick studies, and they picked it up really quickly. And that's true in this war too. Whereas some of the professionals, you know, people with military experience, like I'm going to – I'm talking to you, Charles Lee and Horatio <laughs> Gates. They were terrible. So again – as in the Civil War, previous military experience did not necessarily mean you would be a superior commander to somebody who had no experience. A lot of American officers had been tradesmen. That that amazed the British. The British soldiers would come over and they'd say, well, look, their generals are they're merchants and they're shopkeepers and they're farmers and things like that. They're not soldiers. So that's the main difference, I, I would say, other than the fact that the British Army was equipped so much better than the American Army. Another major difference is that the British Army was a professional fighting force. These guys were pros, whereas the Americans were rookies <laughs> at best. They were uh, very few of them had been professional soldiers. Well, I think throughout the series, James will provide a lot of the factual raw material here. And here and there, I can sprinkle in some of the historical theories and interpretations about what people think about different battles. But in light of what you explained here about how poorly equipped the Continental soldiers are. They have no supplies. They seem to have no money at many times during the war. It's led many uh, historians to put forth theories of how on earth did the Americans win? Some have argued that when the British increased troop strength uh, in the middle of the war in order to knock the Americans out, they were in the Carolinas. It had been irrigated, leading to swamp conditions and lots of mosquitoes. So many of them died of malaria. So that to say that some historians blame it on environmental conditions that knocked out the British, not necessarily the superior tactics or superior bravery of the Americans. So I say a lot to say that the plausibility of an alternate theory than the fighting ability of the Continental Army seems plausible to a lot of historians because the odds are heavily stacked against them, or at least it looks like they're not in a shape to uh, win a war, at least at first. So it's an uphill battle right here. Yeah, and the Continental Army, they're going to get better. They're going to get a lot better. When I said they were a bunch of amateurs and rookies, that that was certainly true in 75, 76. Uh, but later on, we're going to see that Washington and some other people are going to whip them into shape. And by the end of the war, uh, the American army is probably as good as any army in the world. I don't know. That's, I may be exaggerating there, but they're certainly equal to the British. All right. Well, that is an overview of British and Continental soldiers. We're going to get into the war in the next episode with Bunker Hill, and we're going to give a formal and proper introduction to George Washington. See you there. Thanks for listening to the Key Battles of the Revolutionary War podcast. If you'd like more info, go to keybattlesoftherevolutionarywar.com, where you'll find show notes, maps, and other resources that we talk about in these episodes. And if you like the show, please rate and review us on the podcast player of your choice. It helps us grow the show and reach new listeners. Until next time, my friends, grab your tankard of ale or glass of madeira and raise a toast to liberty. Liberty.